very much for inviting me to this, I must say, very impressive <clears throat> event. I will be talking about the multi-annual financial framework that is the European budget for the next seven years. And there will be numbers. Uh, but budgets are politics in numbers. And so I will try to explore the politics of these numbers, the politics of the negotiations, which uh, bring together about the worst struggles which the European Union undergoes now every seven years uh, to come to an agreement and it brings out the best and the worst of the European Union in these negotiations and we will look at it. But I hope also to explore with you what's in it, what is in this financial framework for us, for you, for citizens to make use of to grasp, to invest, to work with, uh, because uh, clearly you may sense from my presentation that we will feel this is not quite enough, but there is a lot, and that is I, what will, I will be focusing on, what's in this uh, for us, for you, for the citizens. Um, allow me a brief introduction into the topic for those of you who are not dealing every day with the EU budget, I suspect there are a few. Uh, if we compare the European budget with the budgets of the member states, can you find the EU budget on this? Uh, yeah, it's down there. The EU budget is about 1% of gross national income of the European Union, and the national budgets are about 40 times bigger. So it's a small budget we are talking about. And it's a very specific budget. The European Union, for historic reasons and for reasons of its past, still spends the biggest part of its budget that's in green for agriculture. Uh, about nearly 40% of its budget still. The second big spending block in yellow, that's cohesion. That's for uh, economic, social and territorial cohesion. Uh, for competitiveness, that's for networks, for students, for research. We have just a bit more than 11% of our budget. Um, and for our external programs in red, it's just 6.5%. 5.5% um, are spent on administration. I will mention it only this once. Uh, but you may in your conversation sometimes hear that the European Union is spending much too much on administration. You can tell them. Uh, we are the budget which spend the least of all the budgets in the world on administration. It's just five and a half percent of the <coughs> for administration. So it's really um, a small part of it. Um, is the European budget ever changing? Um, some think that uh, forever we have spent our money on agriculture uh, and on cohesion. But if you look, um, the share of agriculture has diminished considerably. The share of cohesion has grown. And other policies have more than doubled in their share. So it's changing. But the two years which I'm comparing here are 1988 and 2013. So it's 25 years. Um, so it is changing, but it's changing slowly. Now, sorry, I will not explain all these numbers. Uh, but I just thought, now that I'm talking about a multi-annual financial framework, I should show you at least once how it looks like. Um, this is what the whole negotiation and what the whole struggle is about. It's a, a matrix of numbers. Uh, this is the tip of the iceberg. Uh, these are ceilings. These are maximum amounts which can be spent every year for the main spending areas for the EU board. And they are constraints. With a very few exceptions, we cannot spend more than that. Um, what does this multi-annual financial framework mean? It is a constraint. Uh, the annual budget has to respect it. And therefore, it gives us predictability. It gives us planning security. But it is also, of course, intended as an instrument of discipline. 
We could not spend more if we wanted to. Uh, that's the nature of the framework. There is a degree of flexibility, but it's not that much. So what we can spend in the next seven years, it's pretty much decided now. And then for the next seven years, we know what we have. That's the plus side. It's predictable, it's programmable. You know what you can work with, but also it's not going to change very much anymore. So uh, I could tell you pretty much now what we can spend in 2020. That's uh, part of that phenomenon. Um, you may hear of a package. Um, the negotiations are about a package. And that is quite true. We are not only negotiating about the MFF, the Multiannual Financial Framework, but we are negotiating about all funding programs at the same time. So more than 70 spending programs from research to cohesion to uh, the external cooperation programs, they are all negotiated right now. Many of them wait now to be adopted, but they cannot be adopted until the framework is adopted. So they are waiting. Um, the own resources decision. You will hear a bit in my presentation about own resources. That's another way of saying the funding of the EU budget. Where does the money come from to fund the European Union? And the European Union budget is the only budget I know which does not have a deficit. We have no deficit, we have no debt, which I'm grateful of at the moment. Um, but it also means that for every euro we spend, we have to collect a euro. So the financing is an integral part of the budget equation at the European level. We are also negotiating in this package many general principles. Principles like simplification, so principles like um, performance orientation, you will hear that uh, a couple of times more in my presentation. Conditionality, what are the conditions to make some money available? Um, these are all issues discussed up to heads of state and government and with the European Parliament. Um, and finally, as it is a package, all kind of other issues always come into the very same negotiations. And uh, the guiding principle is nothing is agreed until everything is agreed. This allows a compromise, but it also makes it so hard and so long because you have to agree everything before the package can come to life and can actually work. Now, how have we approached this financial framework? Let's start exploring it. The European Commission, as always, was the first mover getting um, the negotiations underway. And the European Commission uh, followed a few principles. Now, I'm trying to take this microphone. Can I do that? Yes. Yeah, so I can move a little. Um, the European Commission aimed at having a modernized budget. You may remember in 2008-2009, we had the most thorough review of the EU budget which we ever had. We had meetings like that with many stakeholders. We had discussions across Europe. And what we learned was that there was a lot of criticism. <coughs> um, criticism, for example, researchers telling us, you have spent money for 20 years, and we cannot detect any impact. It's as if you hadn't spent it. Well, what's happening? Uh, others are telling us, you have making money available, but it's so difficult to use. Um, it's full of conditions and complications we cannot really get at the money. So we heard a lot of criticism, and we tried um, to present a modernized budget, uh, to learn a lot of lessons from this uh, criticism. So it has been, let's say, general überholt, as you would say in German, it has been really uh, rethought from the bottom up. Um, and a few of those conclusions which we have built in are here. Um, the budget has to be better targeted. It is a small budget, it makes no sense to fund everything. We have to focus at what helps us achieve our economic strategy, which at the moment is the Europe 2020 strategy. Smart, inclusive, sustainable growth. Our euros must focus on that. Um, we have to make it more conditional. 
Unfortunately, there have to be conditions met for the money, and there have to be conditions for what it is used to make sure the money is going in the right direction. We have to simplify the delivery, and we have to get more leverage. You will find in many programs in the future more possibility to attract money from other funders, from the private sector, from other public projects, so that we have more of a multiplier effect. That's the leverage aspect. Uh, in terms of numbers, the European Commission was very well aware that public budgets are under pressure. So we were looking for savings in some areas of the budget uh, in order to make more money available for the challenges of the future. So it's very much a shift of money to the new priorities. Um, we tried to get multi-purpose expenditure so that with one euro we get several effects. We have not abandoned the traditional policies as some were challenging us to do. Some were saying stop funding the common agriculture policy or regional funding, give it only to the poorest regions and for the rest stop it. We did not follow this, but we uh, were thinking about what is the legitimacy and we need new legitimacy for these traditional policies. Um, and, of course, always keeping budgetary rigor in mind, because that would be a big factor of the negotiations, including savings in administrative expenditure, um, which have in particular, I think, a symbolic value. Sorry. Um, on the funding side, the Commission proposed new own resources, new sources for funding the EU budget, and it tried to have a more simplified approach to the so-called rebates, which always pop up when we discuss the EU budget. The I want my money back discussion is inevitable uh, when we talk about the European budget, and the Commission proposed to make that more simple, more transparent. Um, I have a very complicated slide now here in front of you, but um, I'll take you through it because it is an illustration of the Commission's strategy. If you look at the bottom line, you see total appropriations, and it's unchanged. And so we have 2013, and we have the average of the next seven years, and that was the core idea of the Commission. The total should be unchanged. We don't want more uh, compared to 2013, but we shift our priorities. Uh, we allow the funding for cohesion policy, for example, to go down somewhat. Some of our regions have done pretty well, so they are moving up the scale, and they don't need so much uh, cohesion support excuse me, anymore in the future. And we have proposed to somewhat reduce uh, support of the common agriculture policy. And this allows very massive increases in other spending areas. If you look at the second line, competitiveness, plus 23%. Infrastructure, plus 260%, so nearly three times as much funding as before. And with strong increases also, for example, in the area of freedom, security and justice, that's very important now let me just mention Lampedusa. I mean, that's uh, very much where the EU needs to have extra money available and for external expenditure. So this is just an illustration of how the Commission has constructed its proposed new priorities. And that's another way of illustrating it. So you have the comparison between currently and the future. Research and innovation going up, education and culture going up, Networks, very much so, and also security and global Europe. Um, on the